Hi everyone, my name is Moni. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And today we're going to show you how to play a game that is currently on Kickstarter called Florence. This one's published by Braincrack Games and it's designed by Dean Morris and it's the third in a trilogy of games from the same publisher. That's right. I believe it was Ragusa. Ragusa. And then Venice. Yep. And then now we have Florence. Yes, the other city. All, yeah, named after cities. Yeah. And so this one is mainly centered around area control, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a party that's going on. We're kind of traveling around, putting our people out onto the board. And we're trying to level up our status in society. We're really trying to impress the elites. And so we're going to show you how to play today. But before we get started, we do want to mention that this is a prototype copy of the game. Mm -hmm. Some of the components are subject to change in the final copy, especially some of the colorings on the carriages, etc. Mm -hmm. It is a high quality prototype, but like she said, things will change. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in learning more about this game, including the campaign details, we will leave a link to the campaign down below. Now, if you can all do us a big favor and turn on your Klingon subtitles, just in case we need to make any corrections, we could add those there. We'll also add them to the description if we need to. And if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing. And with that, we are ready to get started. So if you please direct your attention to the center of the table, we are all set up here for a two-player game of Florence. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Florence. Thank you. This is the big city here, right here on the main board. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of give you the lay of the land, each player has their own player board, which is going to house a lot of our pieces. And it'll also tell us the different actions we can take as well is how much time we have to spend on these actions. Yes. The main board is home to the nine different locations, which we are going to be traveling to, as well as the three noble carriages, which they are going to be using to travel around the city as well. Yes, there's a rockin' party going on in the city, and they are traveling. And last but not least, we have this circular board over here, which is home to a lot of some really important information that mm -hmm. we're going to be referencing throughout the game. And so in this game, players play as different nobles who are trying to increase their stature in society. Yes, we want our whole family to kind of level up and be on par with the Medicis. And so there's a big party going on tonight, and so <laughs> we're going to be running around town trying to do various things in order to impress the Medici That's family. Right. The game is played over nine rounds, and whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. Now, before we discuss round structure, I just kind of want to give a general overview of what we're actually going to be doing in this game. Mm -hmm. These three carriages represent the three different nobles who we are trying to impress as they travel around the city. And so each round, one noble will move around the board to try to get to their destination. And the destination are these uh, circular areas here that correspond to the same colored noble. Mm -hmm. I will make note, in the final production copy, this carriage, which is this kind of maroon color, will be more in this pinkish hue. And so players who have family members in each of the locations where these carriages will stop along the way is going to earn points. Mm -hmm. And so this game is all about positioning your family members in the proper locations at the right times to score you the most amount of points. And so the first thing that happens in a round is players will earn time, and time is what we're going to be using to spend to take our actions. The amount of time that we earn from round to round is highly variable if we kind of just draw these uh, these chits from a stack. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the first round where all players start with 12 time. Then players take turns starting with the first player taking one action each until everybody passes. Mm -hmm. And so we're just going to briefly discuss all the different types of actions you can take on your turn, starting with placing family members out onto the board. Each player will start with one of their debutantes out on the board. So just for demonstration purposes, I will put mine here. And I'm going to place my debutante right here in location number eight. Players also start the game with one scheme card, which is basically going to award them points at the end of the game for having family members in those circled locations. Yep. Mm -hmm. These are kept a secret, face down for the entire game. Now, the first type of action that you can take on your turn has to do with placing more of these debutante pieces out onto the board. And so in order to do this, you must spend four time. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. And then you essentially just pick a location that has room for more family members in its queue and place your debutante there in the highest spot. So say I want to place my uh, debutante here in location four. Um, it's completely empty right now, so I would place it right here in the purple spot, which is called the prime position. So each of these locations has uh, one prime position each. Yep. And so the significance of that is each time a noble enters a location, the person who owns the family member in the prime position is going to get awarded a lot of points. And so you really want to have your family member there at the right time. The next type of action requires you to spend five time in order to upgrade your debutante to a Donna or a Donna to your single maestro. And the reason why you might want to do this is because not all family members are uh, treated equally in mm -hmm. line. Whenever family members queue up in these lines, they do it in order of seniority. Yep. So say, for example, in this location, Naveen and I both have a debutante each. Mm -hmm. And so technically, Naveen controls this location because he is in the prime position. Yeah, I arrived there first and then Monique then went there second. If I were to upgrade my debutante to Adana by spending five time, 
my piece would actually skip Naveen's piece in line because the Donna has more seniority than the debutante. Exactly. And so now I control this location. Maestros have even more seniority than the Donna's. So if a maestro were to appear in this uh, location, then it would also skip the line and go ahead of the Donna. Mm -hmm. But again, the only way to get the maestro on the board is by upgrading a Donna piece. So once you have a family member that's out in a location on the board, the only way to get them from point A to point B is by moving them. So there's three different ways that you can do this. The first way is if you spend one time unit, so something like this, I can move to one adjacent space. So from this six spot, I can go either to the three or down here to the seven. So let's say I want to do that and put that right over there. The other thing you can do is instead of spending one, I could spend two more time units or three total to move that one individual uh, family member, either two spaces or split up two movements between two different family members. So in this case, I could go one, two. And there are these tiny shields here that kind of uh, represent all of the pathways that you can cross. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the park, by the way, this is the one area that uh, the family members cannot trespass. Each location also has one of these brag cards, and these are essentially scoring conditions that players can try to achieve. Mm -hmm. In order to score these cards, you have to take a brag action that costs one time. And so, say for example, I were to take a brag action for this location over here, location 6. This brag card says you score 5 points for each Donna and Maestro that you have on the entire board. Mm -hmm. In order to score these, the rule is you have to have at least one of these available, and you also have to have a family member in the location that you're trying to score. Right. Thematically, they are bragging in that location. Exactly. And so I can go ahead and spend my one-time unit, and then I would place my brag token on one of these three spots, depending on how many points I earned from this card. Mm -hmm. So seeing as I only have one Donna on the board right now, I'm going to score 5 points which is going to be this, this bottom most spot right here. But at least I'm on the brag card. Yes, and you <laughs> immediately don't forget to get your five points. Yes, and this is significant because at the end of each round, when the noble uh, travels around the board, the person whose brag token is the highest mm -hmm. on the card of each location that the carriage enters is going to get one of these uh, scandal cards. Yes, you know a little bit of something. Yes, and scandal cards just essentially let you do a, another kind of action on your turn. Mm -hmm. Speaking of scandal cards, in order to play them, you must take an action. Yep. And so each type of noble has their own scandal deck that kind of behaves according to the noble type. And so the amount of time that you have to spend in order to spend the card is listed on it. So for example, this scandal card says always send your best. You swap one of your family members with a lower rank piece at an adjacent location. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to cost three time in order to do it. So each stack has a wide variety of things that you can do that'll help uh, influence the flow of the game. And the last type of action you can take is giving a noble a gift. Mm -hmm. And so each player has six total of these gift tokens, three of which you actually start the game with. The other three you have to acquire uh, in rounds three and six. Yep. Taking this action allows you to place one of your guards onto the board. And these guards will do different things for you depending on the noble who you gave a gift to. The amount of time that you have to spend to take this action is dependent on how many gifts you've already given that noble. So say I wanted to give a gift to the blue noble, who is uh, also known as Giovanni. Mm -hmm. First of all, I would have to have a family member at the location where the carriage is, because they're probably the ones giving them the gift, they right? They have to physically be present, so yes. it makes sense, yeah. And then I place one of my gift tokens in the spot up here that corresponds to the appropriate noble. And I must spend two time to do this if it is the first time I'm giving that noble a gift. Each additional gift that I give them costs an additional time. Right. So if you were to do this again, it would be three times. Exactly. Yeah. Two for the base and right. one for the gift that I've already given them. Mm -hmm. The red noble turns your guard into an escort. When you give this noble a gift, you must place a guard in one of the shield areas of the red color. And so you're going to find these shields all along the different paths. So say I were to place my guard right there for giving... Um, the red noble a gift. Uh -huh. From now on, anytime my family members need to cross this path, I spend one less time to do it. In addition, anytime my opponents cross that path, I score two victory points. Yes, if I was desperate to go from here into five, I would have to give Monique two points. Exactly. Contesina, the pink noble, allows you to place out a spy. And so you would place out your guard in uh, one of the shields that are on these brag cards. And so what that means is whenever a noble enters a location that has your spy in it, you get to take a scandal card of the appropriate noble. And lastly, Giovanni, the blue noble, lets you put out bouncers. And bouncers are going to be placed along these uh, shields that are next to the queues. You can kind of see them all along here next to all of the lines. 
And what they allow you to do is now whenever I need to put a family member in this queue, my family member automatically goes to the front of its respective line. Mm -hmm. So my debutante still cannot uh, bypass a maestro, but it can get to the very front of the debutante section. And once you've decided that you either choose not to or you can't take any more turns, then you can pass. When you pass, you must first place your pass ring out onto a location where you have a family member. So if I were to pass, I can go ahead and place it right there on location number four. If I'm the first person to do this, then I also gain two time, mm -hmm. which is really, really important. Yep. Now, whenever it gets back to my turn after I've passed, my lowest ranked family member in the location that has my ring gets to move up a space, still respecting seniority. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, if it were to come back to me and you haven't passed yet, then my blue a debutante over here would go uh, ahead of yours and now be in that prime position. Right. However, if I had a Donna there or my Maestro, it would still respect the rules. Mm -hmm. If I'm not able to do this, then I score one victory point each time it comes back to my turn. And once everyone's passed, then play proceeds to the noble movement phase where mm -hmm. one noble is going to be moving around the board. And this is dependent on the round dial. So as you can see, for our current round, the red noble is going to move to their destination, which happens to be over here at location number five. And they're going to follow these arrows along the route, just like that. So starting with location eight, they're first going to award points to the player whose family member is in the prime position of each location that the noble enters. Over here, my debutante is in the prime location, so we consult the dial over here, and it says that for each family member in that position, you get one point. And so since this is all for demonstration purposes, we're not going to move the, the points tracker right now. The player with the highest ranked brag token would also gain a benefit, but because we don't have anybody here, we are going to just continue on to location seven, which we're also going to bypass because there are no people here and uh, there are no brag tokens. It's a ghost town. Yes. So moving on to location number four, where we have a lot going on. So first things first, the family member in the prime location is blue again, so they would get one point. And then orange would gain a benefit because they're actually the only person who has a brag token here. And the benefit would be to draw a scandal card from the red nobles deck. Yep. And now I also get a card because I have my spy in this location. Mm -hmm. So I would be able to draw a scandal card from that deck as well. And now we can fast forward past location one <laughs> where nobody is present mm -hmm. and into our destination, which is location five. So since we've entered the destination, the exact same scoring uh, occurs. Orange would get that one point for being the prime position and nobody would get a scandal card because neither of us have a brag token on that brag card. But now that the noble has reached the destination, additional scoring occurs. The way they score in this particular case is you consult this chart. Where your family members are in the queue is how many points you're gonna get. So for me, being here, I get 11 and four because we're here, and then Monique would get seven points. And that is specific to the Red Noble. The Pink Noble scores very similarly. She also has her own chart that awards points based off of where you are in the queue, but the difference is the Pink Noble only awards Donnas and Maestros. So if there are any debutantes in the queue, they do not score any points for the Pink Noble. She is not impressed. Nope. And finally, Giovanni, the Blue Noble, will score points if you are willing to spend time, mm -hmm. because Giovanni, really wants more of your time. Yeah. <laughs> and so for Giovanni, the player who controls the location by having the most number of family members in that location may decide to spend four time units in order to earn 20 points. Mm -hmm. It's a high cost, high benefit sort of situation. Yeah, so you have to pass at the end of your turn, making sure that you have at least four time units to spend. Players with the second and third most uh, family members in the location also have the opportunity to score some points by giving up time. Once noble scoring is complete, then you go into end of round cleanup, which is essentially passing the first player marker, turning the round dial, potentially gaining more gifts, mm -hmm. and uh, rerouting the destination marker for the noble that just moved. And after the ninth round, then the game ends and you go into final scoring. And at this point, if you have any leftover time, you score one point for every two you have left over, and everyone is going to score their scheme card, and whoever has the most points is the winner. And that is a general overview of how you play Florence. Now, we didn't go over all the nitty-bitty uh, rules here and there, but that is the basic gist of how the game is played. Mm -hmm. This game also has a solo mode, which we didn't go over today. Yep. But if you'd like to learn more about the game, this game is currently on Kickstarter, so we'll include a link to the campaign down below. If you have any questions about anything that you saw today or any kind of rules clarifications, please feel free to leave us a comment down below, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you all so much for watching the video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.